Working in IT means you never really know which tickets are going to land on your desk. Some are quick and easy, and others are difficult tickets that send you down rabbit holes that eat up half your day. In this video, I'm going to discuss in depth five real tickets that I handled last week. Things like Intune policies not applying, OUs not syncing, employee offboarding, managing the new Windows laps and then troubleshooting a difficult SFTP server. This video is gonna be more technical and more in depth than my normal day in the life videos because I really want you to see the process that I'm going through with these tickets. I'm gonna try and break it down in plain English, explain the tools and commands that I'm using and give you some context so you can see what the day-to-day -day life of being a sysadmin is actually like. Okay, so ticket one was an Intune pin policy that was not sticking because CA wasn't enforcing it. So basically the company had configured devices to enforce a six digit pin to access Microsoft resources on mobile phones. Here's some quick context for the beginners. Intune is like Microsoft's device management. This is gonna push configuration, compliance, and security policies to devices across the org. And then conditional access is like the gatekeeper in Entra ID, Microsoft Entra ID. This is like the bouncer at the door. You only get into your Microsoft resources if you meet certain conditions. This is very, very, very important for security for a company. And the conditions are things like you have to have MFA. You have to be on a certain managed device and it has to be updated to some certain specs. Maybe it has to come from the right location. Like you can only sign into Microsoft from something called named locations, which are specific IP ranges. So you have super granular control over who gets into Microsoft in which situation. And in this company's environment, they had a really common CA called RAD Mobile, Require Approved Device Mobile. The intent was that if you're going to be on a mobile device accessing company resources, you have to be in tune, enrolled, and compliant before accessing that data. It sounds good, but here's the whole. Some users' devices were only Azure AD joined. They weren't fully Intune enrolled. If you're not enrolled, you're not compliant, and then Intune's PIN code policy that you have to have a six-digit PIN is never actually applied. Now, the bouncer, Conditional Access, did not have the setting checked that they had to be Intune compliant. So in order for me to figure all of this out, I opened up Entra, Security, Conditional Access, and I reviewed this Require Approved Device Policy scope. I started cross-checking against devices that were in Intune and that weren't in in tune it's trying to figure out why some of them were getting this applied and some weren't. I found that devices that were enrolled in Intune did indeed have that six pin policy applying to them successfully. Devices that weren't didn't have it. But again, conditional access wasn't checking that you had to be enrolled in Intune. So my plan was to tighten the flow so that conditional access forced people to get enrolled with Intune. So then Intune forced them to have that six digit pin. So there was no real registered only loophole. Like you had to be Intune registered in order to access Microsoft resources on your phone. Now, I communicated these plans to the tier one and also worked with the primary engineer of how we're going to do this. My thought was to set up another conditional access policy, apply it only to one user, and that user had to not already be in Intune. And in that conditional access policy, we would force them to use Intune, say that it has to be compliant with Intune. They would be forced to download the company portal, get the phone compliant, use the six digit pin. Once we could verify with that one user that that was working, we would spread that second conditional access policy out over the entire company and delete the first policy. So once the tier one confirms all of this with me and that the pin is being enforced for that device, we can move forward with next steps. A good takeaway is just to be checking device registration in Entra and in Intune and understand that registered in Entra does not mean that it's enrolled in Intune and that conditional access can only enforce compliance on devices that are enrolled in Intune and you have to actually check that it's checking for that as well. Okay, so ticket two was an onboarding miss that came back to bite us big time. I work for a managed service provider, so we give IT service services to other companies. And when this organization was onboarded onto us, the organizational units in Active Directory that housed their PCs were not selected to sync up to the cloud, to sync up to Entra. So we have Active Directory and we have Entra, which is the cloud. Active Directory is on-premises. In order for our organizations to be able to enforce things like conditional access, like having the correct device state, we have to have our on-premise objects sync up to the cloud so we can have them called hybrid joined. So again, why does this matter? Because they have another conditional access policy. It's required approved device windows, rad windows. For that policy to pass, the device has to be hybrid joined. It has to be both domain joined and Azure joined or Entra joined, and they have to match. 
hybrid joint. And these devices weren't, so their Outlook apps and Microsoft resources were not working for them. They were getting blocked out by conditional access. So what I did is I was helping a colleague with this actually. I opened the Azure Synchronization Manager, logged into it with our global admin creds, and changed the organizational units that were actually syncing up to Entra. We forced a full sync so that all of those devices would start appearing in Entra as well. The problem is that it doesn't always work so smoothly. They don't just become hybrid joined. Sometimes they show up there and they're like pending registration and stuff like that. So we had to jump onto a lot of affected devices and do some checks to ensure that they were actually fully hybrid joining. We can do these checks by running the following command in PowerShell as an administrator, dsreg cmd slash status. This is gonna help you verify if it's Azure AD joined and domain joined. If a device is stuck, you can run dsreg cmd slash leave. That'll make it leave Azure. It'll stay on your domain, but it won't be Azure. Once it's left, it's in its proper place, it's synced up and I have a pending object in Azure, I can run dsreg command slash join slash debug. This will have it match up and become a hybrid join device. We did this across probably 10 devices since this was a org wide issue that again happened because of a bad onboarding. Once they become Azure joined, then rad windows, that conditional access policy that I was talking about starts passing and things start working and these people can access their Microsoft resources again. So this is a big takeaway. If you have somebody who's getting conditional access and you can confirm this by checking Microsoft sign in logs, always check, is that device in the correct organizational unit in Active Directory? And is it syncing up to Entra and showing as hybrid joined there? This can help you avoid things like rad windows conditional access that we see all the time with hybrid joined devices or rather devices that should be hybrid joined that aren't. And then those commands, DS write commands, leave, join, debug and status are all gonna be very useful for you as well. All right, ticket three was actually a really fun ticket. It was an employee who was getting fired and they were getting fired at a certain time. And I always like to be mixed in on the drama of people who are getting fired. They don't know they're getting fired yet. I'm imagining that their manager is telling them, hey, you're done, you're gone, right? You're fired. And we as an IT people have to get in at this exact time to take away all of their access to company resources so that they can't do anything harmful. So HR comes to me and says, hey, this person's getting fired at 4.30, be ready. You know, like, like get rid of them at 4.30. So here's the process that I follow in these situations. When the clock strikes 4.30 that day, the first thing I do is disable their Active Directory account and block all sign-ins in Microsoft 365. After this, I'm gonna go to Entra ID and I'm gonna revoke any sign sign-ins, and I'm also going to revoke multi-factor authentication sessions. This takes away all of their access instantly, like their sessions are gone. After this, we convert their mailbox to a shared mailbox, and we delegate access to whoever HR tells us to delegate it to. Usually, it's their manager. After it's been converted to a shared mailbox, I removed all of their licenses in Microsoft 365 because we want to use those for someone else. Then I move their account to a disabled OU or a shared mailbox OU in Active Directory just to keep things clean. After this, we have some Active Directory attributes that we need to clean up things like disabled date we're going to put in the description when we disable them they might have certain fields that have certain values in order for dynamic group membership to work and a lot of times we have to take those fields away just delete them after this i'm going to remove the user manually from any groups that they're in so that they don't show up on email lists like people just don't want to see this user's name anymore because it's a disabled user so we're removing them from all those groups now there was one extra step here where hr wanted me to grant access to this user's files to other users so i actually had to relicense them in order to make a link to their OneDrive and share that out to other users, to their managers. Again, relicense them, make the OneDrive link. That makes a SharePoint site. And then I can use something called SPO, SharePoint Online in PowerShell in order to grant access to those managers. It's a really easy process. Honestly, you just type in a couple of commands, log in with the Microsoft uh, Global Admin credentials and give out that access as needed. I guess a tier one takeaway here would just be that employee separations are important. Make sure that you do everything right. Make sure that we're not wasting licenses by leaving accounts licensed. Convert the shared mailbox before you take the license away. And keep in mind that maybe you're gonna have to give their files to someone else. And if you have to do that, you're gonna have to relicense them temporarily. Okay, ticket four was a big project ticket. And honestly, I feel like it should have been a project, but it was an amazing learning experience for me. We were setting up LAPS, local administrator password solution for a company using the new Windows LAPS that's baked into the operating system. So a quick background is the old LAPS would push out an MSI client using GPO, group policy. And that client would rotate a local administrator password on that device at a certain interval, whether it's like seven days or 30 days. And then it would store this local administrator password in Active Directory in a plain text attribute called MSMCS admin password. The new Windows LAPS is actually baked into Windows 11 operating system and you don't need to have that MSI or that GPO pushing out the MSI. It also encrypts the password and saves them to Active Directory, but you can also save them to Intune or Entra if you want to. This is all much better from a security standpoint and Microsoft is getting rid of the old laps anyway. So here's how this played out. 
Firstly, the local administrator account choice. At first, I thought that this new lapse policy would create a new account like syslocal if I told it to. However, that's I realize that's not how it works. It actually only manages an account that already exists. So this organization from their old lapse policy had a custom account called custom admin, and that's the one that I used. I found that before updating anything, I had to update Active Directory attributes. The whole lapse schema was not in Active Directory yet, so I had to send a command. Update lapse ad schema this was on the domain controller and it updates those attributes to have things like ms lapse password which is where the password is going to be stored ms lapse password expiration time which is when it's going to rotate next and then ms lapse encrypted password a couple of things for the encryption side of things in order for the new policy to process i had to push this command invoke lapse policy processing and i realized nothing's writing back like it's not writing these passwords back to active directory like it's supposed to then i realized that the computers didn't have permissions to write their own lapse passwords back to active directory so i had to run the following command set lapse ad computer self permission identity and then I would put in the OU structure for that identity. So this gave all of the computers in that OU permission to write their own lapse passwords back. After this, I rerun invoke lapse policy processing. And again, now the passwords actually appear in AD and I'm able to grab them. So at the beginning of this ticket, I actually did not have these passwords encrypted because the domain functional level was not at a level high enough in order for us to have encrypted passwords, basically. It was running Windows Server 2019, but the functional level can be a lot lower. And I think it was at 2012. Since then, I did a bunch of tests and a bunch of after hours work raising the domain functional level and getting things ready in order for us to be able to write encrypted passwords to Active Directory. So this one took a lot of rounds of work. There was a schema update, policy retries, permission tweaks, and then raising that domain functional level. I will say when it finally clicked and those encrypted passwords were showing in Active Directory and I was able to retrieve them as plain text, I was super satisfied. I was very happy. All in all, I think this ticket probably took me five hours. And then the last one was a very easy ticket, but also useful. Our SFTP server was ballooning because this one SFTP client was saving a ton of folders, I should say a ton of files to an archive, and it was just ballooning and filling up this disk space like crazy. The vendor has like a built-in cleanup job that's supposed to clean up these files, but it's just not working. So I put together a script to clean up old files based off of file creation date. Now, I shouldn't say that I created it myself. I created an iteration, and then I worked with the primary engineer who created his own iteration at adding things that were super useful to the script. Here's the things that the script does. Firstly, it has a dry run mode option where it will not actually delete any files. It'll just tell you which files would have been deleted had you actually run live deletion. It has an age filter, so it'll filter for files that are older than N number of days. I think right now we have it at 60 or 90 days. It has batching, so it batches the deletion process in chunks because we're literally talking about millions of files. If we try to get PowerShell to delete millions of files at once, it would just bloat memory usage on the server and crash the server. So it deletes them in batches of 1,000 files at a time, and then it goes on to the next batch, 1,000 more files onto the next batch, 1,000 more files. It also logs. I was really big on logging, and he even built it out even better, where it'll write a CSV log file for all of the files that were deleted, what their creation time was. It's all nice in a CSV. Uh, the log file ends up being pretty big, like 100 megabytes itself, but it's really nice for me to be able to send to the internal contact and say, hey, these are all the files that would be deleted or that we deleted. And then it even has guardrails where for 15 seconds, when you say run a live deletion, you click yes or, or type Y, click enter. It'll say, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Like click any key now if you want to walk this back and not do it. That's super useful as well. So for now, the way I'm running this script is just manually hopping into Windows at like 9 p.m. when not a ton of tasks are going through and just running the script. It takes like five to eight hours, depending on how many files it's cleaning up, but it does successfully clean them up, brings our SFTP server usage way back down, and I need to work with the vendor to get to where we can just have this automatically cleaned up. At that time, we will retire this script, but for now, it's a great homemade solution to solve our issues. Big things that I learned with this one was that T3 teaching me about dry runs, good thing to add into a script. He also put a bunch of nice comments where it's a synopsis, who made it, what the script's supposed to do, how it works, where it writes things, and all that was super useful. And then that 15 second buffer time where it's like, hey, are you sure you can click a key and undo this right now? So that's that. Thank you guys so much for the support recently. Certainly appreciate it. That was five tickets that took a lot of my time. We're really deep kind of sysadmin tickets. And I hope you, I gave you enough detail for you to be able to understand what was going on, uh, but also not too much detail to bore you. Appreciate you guys for all the support. Be safe, be smart, have a good week, and good luck with those tough IT tickets.